So to get things kicked off with our main guest speaker for today, um, so our month gathering today features secular activist Zach Coughlin, a college student who has recently emerged as one of the most compelling voices for science advocacy in the country. Zach recently spearheaded a campaign to rally Nobel laureate scientists in opposition to the Louisiana Science Education Act. Uh, he also conceived of the second giant leap for mankind, humankind, and he has also led an ongoing campaign to fight creationist vouchers. Uh, Zach was the recipient of the Hugh Hefner First Amendment Award. Uh, he's made numerous appearances in both local and national media, including recent appearances on Moyers and Company, Real Time with Bill Maher, and MSNBC, as well as cover stories in the Houston Press and Houston Chronicle. He's also a regular contributor of both the Huffington Post and Slate.com. Uh, Zach recently testified before the Texas State Board of Education regarding the major violations of church-state separation in the new social studies standards, uh, which will be used over the next decade, both in Texas and nationwide. He will also be speaking about his experience at the Louisiana Prayer Rally hosted by Governor Bobby Jindal. Uh, and sponsored by the extreme right-wing American Family Association, where he was uh, in attendance as a reporter for Slate.com. So please give a hand to our guest speaker today, Zach Coppin. So first, I guess I got to apologize for not being here last month when I was supposed to be. And as Vic said, I was in Baton Rouge dealing with this response rally. And do y'all remember in 2011 when Governor Rick Perry held his own version of this? Got about 35,000 people to come out um, and used it to launch his run for president. He announced he was running five days after he held this rally. And so the governor of my home state, Governor Jindal, thought it'd be a great idea to do the same thing. Get 35,000 people out there, get their phone numbers, run for president, and so he worked with this group, the American Family Association, who are best known for saying things like uh, homosexuality caused Nazism, and maybe if the Native Americans had just converted to Christianity, they wouldn't have been wiped out, and they would have been way better. For them. So that, that's sort of their claim to fame right there. And they sponsored this rally with Governor Tyndall. And, the pro and so Tyndall, he even used the exact same, like, Sheet, the promotion sheets that Rick Perry used, where they talked about all the disasters America faced, like Hurricane Katrina, which was apparently only six years ago. Because they never bothered to check their sheets they were using and change them from Rick Perry's. And actually, Katrina is sort of, it was a pretty big moment in my life. It's actually the 10th anniversary this year, so it was a little bit wrong. Um, anyway. The unfortunate, like, so normally when you get these events, I'd be condemning them separ on separation of church and state. You can't do this. Except for Governor Jindal, it just sort of failed completely. And the last time I was in the same building that Jindal held this event was my high school graduation. And we had about as many people show up for my high school graduation as for Governor Jindal's prayer rally. And so he may have done a better job being valedictorian of my high school, getting more people to come speak to him than this other event if he was launching his campaign for president. So I'm not too worried. I mean, in a sense, yes, condemn him for ignoring the Constitution, but it shouldn't really even matter because he's going nowhere. And that, that's just sort of how I saw it. Anyway, so um, I don't know how many of you have been here when I've spoken before, but I grew up in Louisiana, and my state really, really likes creationism. And so back in the 1980s, we had this thing called the Balanced Treatment for Evolution Science and Creation Science Act. And that law mandated that every time evolution was taught in public school science classrooms, creationism would also be taught. And that was thrown out by the Supreme Court in the Edwards versus Aguilar ruling in 1987. It was one of the pivotal cases on evolution and made it so you could not teach creationism in public schools anymore. And you would think after having one expensive, embarrassing major court case in Louisiana about not teaching creationism, you would stop passing creationism laws. But instead, in 2008, we passed what's known as the Louisiana Science Education Act, which sounds great. Everyone likes science education, except that this law is not actually about science education. It allows the so-called critiques of evolution to be taught with 
sort of unapproved random supplemental materials um, in public school science classrooms. And that's been widely understood to be creationism because the legislative sponsor of this law, uh, Senator Ben Nevers in Louisiana, said straight out it was to teach creationism wherever Darwin's theory was taught. Governor Bobby Jindal, Mr. Prayer Rally, said it was to have creationism taught. He said, he, yeah, he said, he wants, he, want, he thinks kids should learn about intelligent design, creationism. He asked, what are we afraid of if we teach them this? And the, per, the group who was responsible for drafting this law in the first place is the Discovery Institute, which is a think tank based in Seattle, um, best known for making, intelligent, making up intelligent design and creationism as a legislative strategy after creationism was ruled unconstitutional. And they were the ones responsible for this language. And so this passed when I was a sophomore in high school back in 2008. And I waited a couple of years thinking, surely someone's going to repeal this law. It, like the governor is a Brown University biology major. He's a very smart man. He knows creationism is not real. It will be gone within a year. And so I waited a year. And I was a junior in high school. And I, I checked back and said, the law is still here. Well, I'll give it one more year. And it's going to be repealed. This can't last. It's the 21st century. And it still wasn't repealed. And I realized by that point, it was my last year in Louisiana that I was sure I was going to be there for. And it was my last chance to really do anything about this law. And so for my high school senior project, I launched a campaign to repeal it. And we got really everyone you think you need on board when you're fighting a law about science. And so we had 78 Nobel laureate scientists. We had all the major science organizations, the American Association for the Advancement of Science with 10 million members, the Association of uh, is Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, uh, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology actually pulled the convention out of Louisiana in protest of this law at one point. So we, we had leading scientists, we had Ken Miller, we had Niles Eldridge, all the people who have made the major discoveries that have backed up evolution. Everyone, all the educator groups in Louisiana, we had the Louisiana Association of Biology Teachers, we had the uh, National Association of Biology Teachers, really all the people you think you'd listen to when you're appealing a law about science, except we didn't really have the support of the Louisiana legislature. And so the first year we came into the legislature, this woman, uh, now thankfully former state senator Julie Quinn, explained to us that she wasn't going to vote for us because she was really tired of hearing from all these people with little letters behind their names. And <laughs> she did make very, very clear to us, though, there was, there was one person who did whose little letters mattered, and that was her. She had JD behind her name. She made it clear we knew that. But everyone else's little letters behind their names, did, like she, did, she was just so tired of hearing from them and just wanted us to go away. And so after she led the charge against us, we got killed in a vote five to one. And the next year, she was no longer in office. So we'll, we'll maybe have a better chance. But there was a new member of the Louisiana Senate Education Committee we were about to meet, which was Senator Mike Walsworth. And Senator Walsworth, uh, he explained to us he, that his science teachers had never really uh, taught him evolution. They just skipped that chapter in high school. He, look where he turned out. He's, on, he's in the state legislature, so it all was fine. And, um, and so he decided he would help show us where we were wrong about this and decided to Google the flaws of evolution in the hearing. And uh, so first he started by reading about the, 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 the fact that moculars proved that evolution was wrong. Um, which he, he kept repeating moculars until someone realized he was trying to say molecular. Wow. <laughs> and, and sort of corrected him on that one. And so his next attempt was to come back and explain, well look, can you demonstrate evolution in an experiment? And so a science teacher was with us, she had won science teacher of the year a few times in Louisiana, um, started explaining Richard Lenski's experiment as if she was explaining to a middle school child, basically, uh, about how they've taken uh, they're not vials, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but the little, uh, no, petri dishes of uh, E. coli. And they've frozen, they let sort of the E. coli breed, and then they'd freeze them at various stages, and then they'd take the new sample, and a week later they'd freeze that one. You can actually watch, they've done it for 25 years now, as the E. coli have sort of changed and evolved over time. And so she's in this explanation, and Senator Walsworth cuts her off and goes, will it ever turn to a person? <laughs> and, and refused to uh, vote with us. He refused to vote with us on that grounds. And so we came back the next year, and we 
Sarah Wallsworth told us he was more prepared. He had Wikipedia evolution this time before uh, <laughs> before he got into it. But the, the real star of that year was uh, was Senator Albert Guillory, who he he had this experience in Africa recently, where he, he went to Africa and he he he's become very cautious about characterizing things like creationism or faith healing as pseudoscience, because there's this man who was in, in like semi clothed uh, in the dust. Uh, wearing no shoes and shaking some bones, and he kept repeating this semi-clothed, shaking bones. And so this man told him many things about himself that he shouldn't have known. And so he would be very cautious to vote against that this law and keep that kind of science this man practiced outside of Louisiana classrooms. And he was he was strongly opposed on the basis of the faith healer shaking bones to repealing the creationism law. And so that's that's where we've been in Louisiana, and we're trying again for the, now it's going to be our fifth attempt uh, to repeal this law. It probably, I'll just be honest, it won't happen this year, but we'll probably get some more entertaining <laughs> sessions with Louisiana lawmakers and continue to make them vote to, I mean, because it is, it is a fundamental question, are you on the right side of history or the wrong side of history? And this law will be repealed one day, either in the legislature or by the courts, and if these lawmakers really want, they can be looked at for the rest of history as the group of people who put Louisiana kids in the dark ages for a decade. And that we can keep making a vote on that. And so now we can go, actually, but first, there, there's some other fun news from Louisiana. Do you all, did you all hear about the uh, Sabine Parish uh, court case? It was about a year ago. Um, speaking of creationism in Louisiana, we had a biology teacher uh, who, she lives on the border, uh, basically of the Texas-Louisiana border, um, on East Texas, West Louisiana, in Sabine Parish. And she had the student, he had come from Utah the year before, and this was his first time in a rural Louisiana school. And he was Buddhist. And so she, he came into the classroom, and like his teacher made a test. And on his biology test, there was this thing that said, Isn't it, it was all caps, it's amazing, you can go look it up. Um, isn't it amazing what the blank has made with about 25, 26 exclamation marks behind it? And so this 11-year-old kid got this test. He's never met sort of a rural conservative Louisiana fundamentalist before. And he doesn't even know what this is supposed to be. He doesn't know what to put there. And so he just leaves it blank and sort of freaks out at that question and leaves the rest of his test blank. And so the teacher walks up the next day with him. Who is this stupid kid who forgot, who didn't know how to answer the question? You're supposed to put it, isn't it amazing what the Lord has made? on his biology test. And so she mocks him in front of the class. And he has an adoptive sister who's his same age in the class. Goes, well, he's Buddhist. And so he doesn't know what you're supposed to put there. And she goes, well, evolution is a stupid theory for stupid people. And Buddhism is also stupid. And Buddhists are stupid. And so he, the kid comes home. And his mom says, well, look, put Buddha in there next time. And so he puts Buddha in there at his next test, because she includes it on every single test. and. Then, of course, she comes back to the front of the test, class with the test and goes, look, the same kid missed his question twice in a row. Isn't he stupid? Um, and just, he's an 11-year-old kid. And eventually, the harassment gets so bad that um, this kid, his, and I know his dad very well at this point. I haven't talked to him for the past year. And so he was apparently puking in the car out of fear on the way to school because the harassment was so bad to their entire family. And so they went into the principal's office uh, to go talk to him. And as, as they were walking up to the principal's office to meet with her, or meet with him, that principal about their kid being bullied, they see their kid running down the hall in tears because of the latest session of bullying. So they take him immediately, they just skip the principal's meeting, they go to the school superintendent, where she informs them, well, look, this is just how it is, and I'm not offended by the person who like, does my nails having a statue of Buddha in her workplace, so you should be okay with Christianity here. And they had a picture of Jesus in the hallway, like, you walk in school, there's a huge picture of Jesus, there's Bible verses everywhere. This is a public school, by the way, if I haven't mentioned that yet. This is the 50s, right? I don't know, it's 2014. <laughs> uh, 2014. And so, they take him straight to the, and this is the thing that caps it all off. But they take, they go to the superintendent, she goes, well, I'll let you, I will grant you, like, a school transfer. Like, if you're not, if you can't deal with this, which first, it's not about, can they, like, they should just fix it, you shouldn't be doing that. But the superintendent and all of her graciousness decided, well, I'll let you transfer schools to a school where there are, quote, more Asians there, uh, was how she phrased it. And that might help. And so, 
when this came out, the ACLU sued, the school settled, I talked to them, I'm actually writing a story about this right now, I talked to their lawyer, their lawyer was just like, yeah, uh, I saw this, I couldn't defend it, they were clearly breaking the law, so they had to settle. Uh, but that's sort of how creationism is going in Louisiana, I'm looking at, there's a list of at least 20 teachers who've put their names on a document acknowledging they've taught creationism under the Louisiana Science Education Act in the state, and I've been trying to get Unsurprisingly, the school boards who possess this list are not wanting to give it to me, but I've been trying to get that for about a month now, and I'm sure it will eventually come out. Uh, and one little tidbit from that, the person who compiled this list had a great quote in the newspaper fighting Louisiana biology textbooks, explaining Darwin was wrong because he didn't have the microelectronic microscope. Right. And so, if one of you can find me, figure out what a microelectronic microscope is, <laughs> um, let me know. But I, I wasn't, I didn't think they existed. I didn't know what those were. Anyway, on to Texas. So, how many of you all know who Don McElroy is? Yeah. yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He's the old. <laughs> actually, the funny thing is, he actually really likes me. I, I've, we we get along great. We agree to disagree on pretty much everything, but we have very friendly conversations about his kids sometimes, and he's a very sweet man when he's not trying to indoctrinate children with believing they live with dinosaurs. And so that's about Don McElroy. And so Don McElroy was the old head of the State Board of Education in Texas, and he, and he was responsible for getting some really messed up standards in, uh, in Texas schools. And so I've got a couple of these uh, cop like over here. And so they removed, for example, in science classes, it calls for teaching to analyze, evaluate, and critique evolution, just like we have in Louisiana. That we have a law, y'all have to hear, we have State Board of Education standards. And he also got things like uh, they replaced as sort of important cultural movements, they replaced hip hop with country because yeah. hip hop wasn't relevant. Although one of the state board members, uh, she had a great quote. She actually was defending uh, hip hop and uh, being allowed into um, into schools. And one sec, let me find it. Yeah. So she said she didn't like including hip hop, but it should be included um, because these people, meaning hip hop artists, are multimillionaires, and they're not black people to buy that. There are white people buying this. And that was her single rationale. She said it at a board meeting. And like, it's like twisted. It's like, like at least she's including it, but that's so horrifying. She should never be in that position. Um, although, competing with that is board member David Bradley, who, when discussing a uh, course on Mexican American history, described that course as reverse racism and said he was going to pull a Cesar Chavez and boycott the hearing on it, which he then did. So these are people who are currently making decisions on Texas education policy. And they've done things like, say, s slavery was less of a cause of the Civil War than states' rights, that Joseph McCarthy was right in the 1950s. Um, and it's just that Moses, I mean, this is, this is a fun one, which is, this isn't our textbook today. Back last, last year in November, we went in to the state board to try and get them to fix a couple things. I mean, so first, the history textbooks had a section on climate change that said they compared the Science 9 Heritage Institute, which isn't, doesn't do any real science, with the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, which is probably the most respected body in the world on climate science, won a Nobel Prize for its work. They put them as equal in one of the textbooks, as if they were both sides, and said there was doubt about climate science. So we got that removed. They, they said that Moses was sort of the foundation of the American Constitution. We got into many arguments with, uh, with, uh, with the state board members about how Mosaic Law was not actually, and then one of um, board member Hardy who made the comment about hip hop uh, was insisting that Mosaic Law influenced English common law, influenced um, American law, which the problem is Mosaic Law says things like uh, do not eat grape skins and do not touch a woman while she's menstruating, which really ha like, have nothing to do, it was also for a theocracy and a monarchy, which America is none of. And so this comes from state standards that, uh, that say basically they put Moses as one of the people who, founding people who influenced America. And 
that actually led to a lot of descriptions of Texas saying that Moses was a founding father, which the state board members objected to. They claim they never said that, but got a nice exchange where it's saying, well, look, the books seem to say that, and that's the problem. That's why you're hearing all about Moses being an American founding father. And our books have come out a mixed bag, where they originally, like, there was a lot of complaints about how, uh, um, and there's a great quote from uh, this group, the, the uh, Texas, Truth in Texas Textbooks, this new group, far right winging, that has been pushing a lot of revisions, and they got a lot of their revisions in there, um, where they, they were very angry about a passage in one of the books that described Islam as spreading through also, beyond just conquest, also trade and missionary work. And they were angry and said uh, that on, the only way Islam spread was through attacking or killing, and uh, that the overwhelming method of conversion um, was from terrorist groups under the Islamic umbrella of some multi-syllable name, attacking and killing people. That's how he described it. Is that that was, the, and he was very angry that the books only treated Islam or did not treat Islam as only attacking and killing people, and that's all it should be. And except that you, you this belief is sort of more common than you think because our current lieutenant governor was running ads claiming that ISIS was infiltrating Texas from the southern border. So, so I mean, you'd be surprised. And um, there, there was a great problem with one of the textbooks they had where they, they were angry that a textbook portrayed Sam Houston in a dress. The textbook publisher then responded, this is actually Cherokee garb from when Houston lived with the Cherokees. Um, or, I mean, the fact that uh, we, let's see, there, there was one. There was one speaker who, and th this this quote was a gem. Who was complaining about communist infiltration of textbooks, and that actually went too far for the state board members. Uh, and board member Hardy asserted, "We have the best, most pro-American standards of any state in the U.S." So, that's sort of where we are. Evolution, not real, pro-American. Uh, Moses, founding father, pro-American. I mean, sort of twisted. <laughs> Thankfully, while we have terrible history textbooks, we actually have really good biology textbooks in Texas. Because um, in 2013, we actually had adoptions for these. And they, the, the textbook publisher is a much straight, more straightforward fight. Because in history textbooks, you have every different group. Um, you have the indigenous lobby, you have the Israel lobby, you have the Palestine lobby, you have the great, like just sort of the truth textbook, Texas textbook, crazy right wingers. You have the Sea Coalition who comes because they. Um, the textbooks that originally called them a subset of Hinduism, which they're not, and you have so many different groups coming in, it gets very, very confused. But with biology, it's just evolution is real, climate change is real, versus the people who say they're not. And again, climate change came back up, and evolution too came back in the history textbooks. Um, the Texas Eagle Forum actually insisted that teaching about climate change was a UN conspiracy theory to uh, redistribute wealth, was how they described it. Um, but, but luckily, at least our biology textbooks and climate science textbooks are all right. And they teach evolution well. The textbook publishers did not compromise in 2013. And despite bad standards, we have good textbooks on those accounts. And the irony is the key player in this was actually Don McElroy, the creationist State Board of Education member, old member, who now, he's since lost his position, he came back to testify, and had this bizarre belief that because of his standards, any smart creationist child would be able to read the <coughs> evolution teaching textbooks and realize how flawed it is. And so he was actually a fan of the textbooks, thinking that a smart creationist child would be able to see exactly how wrong evolution was from them. And so his 10 minute rambling testimony sort of put the, like, was a nail in the coffin for the creationist mind to throw out these books. Um, and we got to keep good biology textbooks here. Unfortunately, even with good biology textbooks, creationism is still being taught in Texas schools. And I actually, on Friday, I got an email from a parent saying that their student had been taught that the uh, teaching evolution or evolution was comparable with Holocaust denial. Um, and this was from somewhere, it's a little bit north of here in East Texas. And uh, their teacher had been showing them the movie Expelled, uh, which is a movie claiming that all the scientists who do intelligent design work are persecuted and not allowed university positions and their work is never published. And I can offer a more simpler explanation for why intelligent design isn't published and that's just because it's not science rather than persecution. I mean, they should do better work if they want to be published. 
but they were showing this movie, they weren't teaching evolution, and the principal described this as just, well, I'm showing there's controversy over evolution, which of course there is not. And so that's happening right now. I guarantee as this develops, um, it will be justified under the Texas State Board of Education standards that say, analyze, evaluate, and critique. And I know this because this is not the first time it's happened in Texas, where this group, Responsive Education Solutions, it's the largest charter school network in Texas. And I actually tend to like charter schools, at least in theory. Um, I like to fight vouchers a lot, but I'm okay with charter schools, except there's not enough accountability. And this had, when I was working on this, and it's now grown probably by 20 schools. But it's, it's probably about 85 schools now, and probably over 20,000 students. It was already at 17,000 students, and receiving oh, about $100 million from the state each year. Um, was teaching that the fossil record was sketchy, that uh, evolution happened, that, that sort of supernatural creation was an equally reasonable explanation to evolution. And then their history textbooks may have been even worse, where they described the resident of, residents of the Filipinos as Catholics, Muslims, and pagans in, quote, various levels of civilization. Uh, was their, how their history textbook described the Philippines. Um, they, didn't, they said that there was doubt over vaccines. They said that stem cell research should be illegal because it was done from aborted fetuses. They, and my favorite one, and actually, I'm a history major at Rice. I've specialized a lot in East Asian history, where they explained that the reason that Japan was involved in World War II uh, was because the samurai were militaristic and got them involved. Problem is, the samurai were disbanded in 1876, which is about 70 years before World War II. So there's no way that the reason this, they were in World War II was the samurai. So it's just sort of blatant factual errors. Oh, y'all may like this one. Uh, the World, World War One was happened because of the uh, because of the Enlightenment. Um, that, that that was how they that was how they explained World War One. Uh, the anti-Christian values from the Enlightenment caused World War One apparently. And so this came out. The school had to admit, yes, we're teaching creationism, um, but it's legal under what the Texas State Board of Education says. So don't blame us. Take it up with them. The Texas State Board of Education announced they were investigating the school. As soon as the fur died down, I called them a couple months later and said, hey, how did the investigation go? They said, oh, we just didn't do that uh, because it's the, Tex or it's the Texas Education Agency. They just decided not to. Um, break apparently, law breaking isn't worth actually investigating. Um, Responsive Ed ended up changing their curriculum in science slightly, but it's not much better. In history, they just said, well, it may be wrong, but it's not illegal. So we're keeping our curriculum. And that was their entire justification there. And that, that's really, that's the state of Texas education right now. We're going to be dealing with more school vouchers, which by the way are public funding for private schools, often creationist schools. There's a bunch in Louisiana right now. Um, one that, my favorite one describes scientists as sinful men who <laughs> do science to try and not have to have God's authority on them. Um, and then there was another one there's one in Florida that called uh, Evolution the Way of the Heathen. That was another of my favorite quotes. And there's, I mean, a lot of them use this curriculum that said the Loch Ness Monster um, has been found and disproves evolution. And by the way, a weird transition from that back to Texas, Responsive Ed was actually founded by the homeschool group that sells to these private schools and that are being funded in Louisiana. They, they were, they're from a, a suburb North of Dallas, um, I think it's McKin McKinsey, McKinney, maybe McKinney, it might not, it's near Plano, it's north of Dallas. And uh, so there was this weird link where their curriculum sort of resembled um, the, the curriculum for these Loch Ness Monster Disproves Evolution curriculums. And so someone sort of made that connection, um, who had worked a lot on investigating those. Turns out the headquarters of this original group, Acceler Accelerated Christian Education, and responsive event are about four miles away and have been switching staff members back and forth for the past 10 years or so, past 10, 20 years since they found this group. And it's basically an extension of this religious group with ridiculous curriculum, which is why you see things like them saying the fossil record is sketchy and evolution is dogma. Anyway, in Texas, we probably will see, we have legislation already introduced to, uh, to, to get school vouchers here. It will probably come up maybe even this week in the legislature. 
Um, it will hopefully not pass. The state house in Texas has been very opposed to school vouchers because it threatens the Democrats and the rural Republicans have made a coalition to block it because it threatens private school or public schools in rural Texas. And so hopefully we'll fail, but that sort of sums up Texas ed policy um, where we are right now, which is bad history textbooks, good biology textbooks, still creationism and bad history in the schools anyway. And I'm happy to keep talking with you all about anything in Louisiana, Texas, um, science funding, um, separation of church and state issues, really whatever you can think of. If you want to ask me a question, I'm happy to answer. So, okay, so yeah, well, um, we've got plenty of time for Q&A, um, but do please be considerate of everyone's time. Uh, keep the questions concise, on topic. And also, uh, we, all, we also have, uh, if anybody doesn't feel comfortable with asking a question vocally, uh, we, we've got some uh, little sheets of paper and pens. We'll be coming around, just raise your hand, and we'll give you, uh, you can submit the written questions as well. All right. My question is, you mentioned one case that the ACLU took about the little boogies boy in Louisiana. Are they taking multiple tech cases in Texas and Louisiana? And are any other states as backward in their educational system no. as the, you, the two that you talked about? So I don't know of any current cases in Texas right now, which isn't to say there aren't any. It's just to say there may be um, sort of in the backlog where the ACLU is working on their case instead of actually having filed and made it public. Um, and so, as far as I'm aware, there are no current cases, but that could just be a lack of knowledge on my part or that they just haven't been filed yet. Um, what I will say, though, on the, is this Louisiana and Texas? Um, so there's about, there's two states that have creationism laws, Louisiana and Tennessee. We, we see about a dozen filed each year. Oklahoma usually takes the cake and most filed, they usually file two a year, two bills to get a creationism law. But we've seen them all over Montana, Minnesota, New Hampshire. It's not just a it's not just a southern thing or even an urban rural thing. Um, and there's about ten, eight to ten states. And I don't know them off the top of my head, like Texas, which have state board of education policies that sort of mirror these laws in Louisiana and Tennessee. And so I think maybe Minnesota has one. If you really want to look, the Discovery Institute, who I really dislike, maintains a list where they brag about these, and so you can look it up there and see exactly who has a law and what the law, or who has, who has a policy and what it says specifically. Um, but what's interesting is the uh, National Research Council, I think it was, did a survey of science teachers around the country and found about 13% of science teachers are directly teaching creationism anywhere in the country, and another 60% are teaching, not, they're not teaching evolution. And so it's worse to teach creationism or teach both creationism and evolution than not teach evolution at all the research has shown, but it comes out to about 70, 75% of the teachers in the country are underserving students when it comes to evolution. And there's not really a substantial divide between north and south, urban, rural, Texas, Louisiana, and somewhere else. It's everywhere across the country. What happens in these states like Texas and Louisiana is there's legal justification so instead of, if, you, if you're in New York City and you teach creationism and you get caught, you're gonna get fired, you're gonna get in trouble, it's on you. You get caught in Louisiana, you say, hey, I was just following the law, take it. You can't do anything to me, take it up with the state. And so it's much more of an incentive for teachers to do wrong and protect them if they've done wrong or if they're afraid of teaching evolution, it will make them a little bit more scared. And so that's what I think the effect of this stuff is. As I understand it, Jindal graduated with a biology degree. And he's a Rhodes Scholar. And, and oh, a Rhodes Scholar. He's a brilliant man, but I question his morals. Well, I, I, I'm wondering, have you gone back to his school and asked him, why is it that he doesn't accept evolution? So one of his teachers at Brown, his uh, genetics teacher actually called on to repeal the law and said, this is not what I taught you. And Jindal ignored him. I actually went to the same high school as Governor Jindal. I know they teach evolution very well. And I actually went to the same middle school and elementary school as Governor Jindal's kids. And I know, I know, I actually talked to their biology teacher the other day, who I know teaches them evolution well. So I'm fairly skeptical Governor Jindal really means it when he says he believes in intelligent design and creationism, but it's certainly been politically useful to him, at least. Oh, 
he thinks it's been politically useful to him. I think it's foolish and it's gonna, I think it makes him a laughing stock on the national stage and it's why he won't win presidency. But he's made a choice to promote creationism, um, not off of what he knows is right, but because he thinks it will get him votes and it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your experience over the past few years, how would you assess our political system? Can you repeat the question? Uh, how, how would I assess our political system? <laughs> it's the best one we've got. Having said that, <laughs> I do not think, sir, I mean, I really, I mean, and it's two questions, is how do you deal with education? And one, I don't think that we should have, that there should be so little accountability in public schools. And having worked in this for a long time, I know the general numbers of 13% of teachers are teaching creationism, we have these laws. It's so hard for me to know what's happening in individual schools, and there needs to be a way to do that. And it needs to be outside of people like Dan Patrick in Texas, or Mike Walsworth in Louisiana, who, Dan Patrick, he had a great line in a debate before, when he was running for lieutenant governor, that creationism, and he, he had this thing where you need to outflank everyone to the right. And so all the lieutenant governor's candidates said, well, we support creationism. And he said, well, I don't think we, I don't want to support creationism. It should be heralded and triumphed in our public schools, was how we decided to address that. And so I don't think these people have any right or any role to make decisions about content of curriculum. And I don't think even the state board members, they're elected to do this, but they're not the ones who should be making these choices because they're not qualified. There should be experts. And so in theory, there's a way, to, a way in place to do this where when we adopt textbooks, for example, we first give them to a panel of experts, supposedly, who are supposed to review the textbooks for content. Now the problem is each state board member chooses experts from their, experts from their district. And so there's only, on the history textbook adoption, there are over 140 experts. Three of them were historians professionally, and only two of them were in the field. The rest were people like pastors and used car salesmen who were chosen as experts to review our history textbooks. And so, in theory, that process should be replaced with uh, having real experts chosen. And there needs to be things like, you have to be a university professor or a high school teacher in the right field to review these books, and we can't have random businessmen and car salesmen doing this. Um, but that's not the way it is. And we sort of saw it work better with the biology books where we had the same problem originally, um, where they were, not, they were not experts reviewing biology textbooks, they were complaining that there wasn't creationism taught. When we got through, we, the creationists knew we were gonna win this fight, and so they wanted to make a point. And the, one of the largest textbooks um, is, was written by Ken Miller, who is a Catholic, and he's one of the strongest proponents of evolution in the country, and he's very well known for talking about how he's had his religious faith and his acceptance of evolution. He's, I, some of you may have, like he probably actually, if anyone was in high school in the last 10 years, he probably read his textbook. He's a great writer, does a great biology textbook, and they wanted to sort of stick it to him and make a point. So they said, we're going to reject his textbook specifically. And it got caught out in this follow-up process where all the other textbooks were adopted, and they said, well, we need a panel of experts to review this textbook and see if it's not wrong. Again, even though it's already gone through all these other reviews. And they actually managed to appoint a panel of actual experts where they did a three-person panel of real biologists, who then said, yes, the textbook teaches evolution incredibly well, adopt it, and it was adopted. And that was a process that was slightly better, but even then, it's just, we shouldn't have people with no qualifications voting on these things. So, it seems to me that children in Louisiana are disadvantaged according, or compared to children in other states. Has there ever been any sort of litigation based on the 14th Amendment and equal protection under the law? Unfortunately, I think this court wouldn't accept that. Um, unfortunately, where they, and they would just reject it based on standing. Where they would say, you, like, you can't, you have, you have to actually even talk creationism to sue. You can't just sort of do a general, Louisiana children are more disadvantaged, it's my taxpayer money going to this kind of argument. Even though that seems perfectly valid, but it just is not accepted by more conservative courts, and that's, it sucks, but it is what it is. And so no one really tries those, at least in this atmosphere. Um, just like, I mean, getting to sort of theoretical court decisions, I mean, can private schools teach creationism? 
they're legally allowed to right now, I sort of think it's child abuse, and you might be able to sue that it's child abuse and can't be done, even if it's a private school, but no one's really seriously tried to advance that argument because it just wouldn't fly in today's courts. Wouldn't a child in Louisiana have standing? Uh, only, it would only be accepted if like this child from Sabine Parish who got told he was stupid and evolution was stupid would have standing, or his parents and his brothers and sisters who were also bullied. And the other, on that case, is also fun. Like they transferred to school anyway, and that is new school kids would touch him with crosses to see if he melted. Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you gotta give him credit for investigating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the this child in LA. Like, and you can you can put him up. See if he weighs more than a duck too, and then so, like, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I don't I don't see it working. I wish it would, but I just don't see it happening. And, and people tend to, the ACLU, the National Center for Science Education, Americans United, the groups who are sort of in the thick of this tend to be very cautious about launching a, launching a case unless they know they can win. Because you don't, I mean, you don't want, uh, you don't want someone, on, you don't want Thomas or one of the other Supreme Court members who are far, far right, Scalia, you don't want them writing an opinion on evolution. Because that can take a long time to undo and would be a problem. And so we have to be very cautious. Even if we know, even if they're totally wrong, we have to be cautious about what we do. And we have good precedent right now, and we want to make sure we don't mess up and lose it somehow. Um, two questions, if I may. Are you associated with the NCSC and Virginia Scott National Center for so Education? I work with them very closely. I've been friends with Jeannie and Josh and Barbara Forrest for years and years. Um, Jeannie's now resigned. I don't know her successor, Ann Reed, very well. And, I mean, she seems to be doing a good job, although Jeannie Scott's shoes are probably impossible to fill. But I, I work with them fairly regularly. Could you repeat the name of the organization? The National Center for Science Education. Right. Um, and on that note, if you have someone who gets taught creationism, tell me. You can find me on Facebook or find my email online. If you know someone's being taught creationism in public school, let me know. If you, or let the National Center for Science Education know, or Americans United for Separation of Church and State, or the ACLU, or the Texas Freedom Network. There's a ton of groups who will take action on this, and can help. Like, and so, <coughs> if you, if your friend's kid, you, because that's what I was hearing the other day, it's like my friend's kid was taught this. Just let us know, and we can help out. If I can uh, continue, I've met Eugenie, and I've, or so just check her website again. Uh, it seems like the last 25 years she's been playing whack-a-mole with these yeah. groups on, in in every state. And I feel that she's on the defensive, and I think you seem to be using the same defensive position and trying to defend science. Have you considered, instead, going on the attack mode and attacking creationism, even in class? So it's, I mean, it's, the problem is there's, there's always things we can do. So good science standards, next generation science standards, we can promote those. That sort of, maybe, I guess we'd say going on the attack. Um, which, of course, and that's also a controversy. I, I, think, I, I don't yeah. consider that going on the attack. No, that's just having good science. Now you've got to attack creationism and criticize it in the classroom. But why would, why would we... That's the first thing you start. But why would you even care about that? It just shouldn't be there at all. We just sort of, it's not no, science, it, we ignore it. it. It's just going to keep on going back and, and back and back. It has to be attacked. Yeah, but we have, I mean, even if they don't play by the rules, we have to, is what I would say there is. It's, it's, it's still by the rules. I well, mean, uh, when you, if a kid learns uh, math the wrong way, you're going to tell him, no, that's not how you add numbers. This is how you add numbers. Yeah. Uh, but, it has to be attacked, and that's why it's not working. I mean, some teachers will always offer as an example of what, what's not science, and that's their prerogative. Uh, but I would never, I mean, because honestly, the way it is in this country is you can, you put, once your kids out of school, you can take them to Sunday school, you can teach them whatever you want. Right. When they're in school, their science teacher says evolution is real, that's a fact. We move on from everything. No, we're not talking about creationism, it's irrelevant because we're going to talk only about science today and show them the evidence um, for that. And the other, the other thing is actually what I would caution, and obviously a teacher doing this right, addressing creationism could be done in a way that doesn't harm the student, but it's been shown that teaching Talking about both evolution and creationism in the classroom actually confuses students more than just ignoring it all entirely. And student, and so they've done some testing where they had teachers who taught, or they had students who were taught creationism, evolution, or both. 
and found that the ones who did best on the test were evolution, the evolution only, and then nothing, and then creationism, evolution, and then creationism. So it's better to even just to like ignore it, is what I'd say on that. I, I disagree. Sorry. I mean, that's what the that's what the yeah. statistics show. I was taught Lamarckism briefly yeah. in Catholic school, and the purpose for that is the teacher wanted to sh make us believe Lamarckism for a few days, and then on the next Monday morning says, what I told you last Friday was wrong. This is not how evolution works, and it stuck in my head for the rest of my life. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah but I'd be okay. cautious to use one anecdotal example. Well, too. that's what happened to all the students in that school, and I guarantee you that teacher was praised over and over again for teaching evolution in a Catholic school. Yeah, but, well, Catholics generally, the, the Catholic Church has accepted evolution for a, a long time. Um, but I would, I would, I would just be very cautious to say one good teacher addressing it right should set a broader policy. I can tell you the methods you're using now aren't working. They're not. Well, okay. For the most part, we kept evolution. We've done, we, I mean, it's hard, you can't attack, like, attacking creationism in the classroom, I mean, the other thing is there's this thing called the backfire effect, mm -hmm. where attacking it directly, and so you, 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 when you give someone more evidence that they're wrong, you, so let's say you gave a creationist a paper that's yeah, free. research it, and find out they're wrong. And, but it's shown, you give people um, evidence that shows they're wrong, and you ask them, you come back and say, well, you read this paper now, did it back up your point? And you'll find that people are more sure of their point even after being given contradictory evidence than they were before. Yeah. And that's how it works. It's a stretch. It, it's, it's how people work, though. It, it's just people, our minds work in weird ways. And that's how, like, and so it's actually sort of hard to even address this where we've always tried to find the right way to make it work. Something about some percentage of teachers that don't teach evolution? Yeah, 60%. 60? 60. Don't address it at all. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60 football coach has to teach a class and says, yeah. oh, you're going to teach biology. And he goes in there, I don't know what evolution is. I'm not, I don't want to teach this. I'm six zero. It's sort of insane. Or they, so they don't know, they don't understand, they don't believe it. They're afraid because they don't want their principal, the parent calling, the principal coming in and saying, don't teach that or you get fired. And so it's a huge amount. It's not as big being taught creationism, but there's a lot of, of fear being about teaching evolution, which is honestly the larger problem in my mind if we're talking about like it's hard to address because it it's more about teacher training and standards and accountability which is more ephemeral um, than saying this school teaches creationism and this policy promotes creationism so we sort of address what we can it's hard to yeah uh, anecdotal also but on the other side I, uh, last time I talked was in the middle of Mississippi, and uh, there the state has a biology test that a student has to pass in order to get a diploma. That's one, and that's just straight out of fact. Yeah. That's Mississippi now. Uh, and uh, moreover, I was in the middle of Mississippi. Now, I used to have some kids come in the classroom, the preachers would be telling them, and I said, this is not church. You want to talk church stuff? You go down to the church, and if you got any problems with the pastor, send them to me. No <laughs> pastor ever showed up. And I said, now if you want a big fight, that's a fair sized group, and they believe in evolution. And I said, that's what we're going to talk about in this class. Nothing else we ignore the rest yeah. of it. And it worked okay. Yeah. And I mean, the one thing about the state testing thing is you would hope that that would be enough to make people teach evolution, but often, the student can fail the evolution portion and still pass the state test, which is, it just, or, or, I mean, I know it works like this in Louisiana where you have like four tests. And so let's say you fail biology totally, but you pass English and math. Then that's still good enough. No, 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 it's not in the city. You have to uh, yeah. pass each of these different uh, categories and you can have a high school diploma. You fail biology, you ain't going to get that diploma. Yeah. 
uh, and any of the others that are required by the state. Now, how did that happen to be and what the situation is now, I don't have uh, any yeah. idea. But I do know. Now, in terms of accountability, you really get into some real ugly problems. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how do you do that? Oh, it's very, very hard. Oh, yeah, very hard. Incidents that you talk about, these come from very old and uh, established school districts, and people have been living there forever. Do you think that current education for teachers is going to improve this going forward? That young teachers who are being educated now to teach others are going to have the skill or the uh, skills or means to buck the system? I would hope. Um, Can you repeat the question? So, do you think? Do I think the teacher training now is going to be more effective at teaching kids to accept evolution? And that I don't know. Um, and so, looking at the numbers on evolution, Gallup. So Gallup maybe is asking some flawed questions when it polls evolution, but it's gotten consistently over the past thirty years that between forty to fifty percent of America believes in young Earth creationism, and so. It's probably less than that, and other polls are coming back at more about 35% of the country. But what's important about this is that the number, no matter what our efforts have been, the number stayed relatively the same. At, it's, kept, it's kept standard. And so I'd imagine that new teacher training may, I don't like, you, you, you try your intervention, see if it will fix it. If it doesn't work, you keep trying, you keep doing something. But it's hard to know exactly what's going to fix those numbers. Um, and part of it, I think part of it does come down to repealing bad laws. And if kids are getting brought up in a classroom where they're taught creationism, then they're going to be creationists. They're going to want more creationism taught in this repeating cycle. And so that, that's sort of the problem is if you can somehow find a point to break that cycle and get a, a class of kids who accept evolution a little bit more, there'll be more teachers teaching evolution, get another class that's a little bit more, and just keep going. That's sort of the positive path we need to be on. And we've been trying to figure out how to do that, I think, for 30 years. <laughs> is, is Thomas Paine in the text revised textbooks in Texas? I think so. Um, I, I don't think they were a problem with Thomas Paine. They had a problem with Thomas Jefferson. Um, they didn't really want Thomas Jefferson in the textbooks or separation of church and state. They didn't believe in that. Um, he ended up getting put in, but separation of church and state is sort of questioned in a lot of the history textbooks in Texas. Really? Yeah. Um, we actually had a debate where the Texas values lobbying group insisted it's been settled. We don't have that, and we already settled that in our standards, and we don't need to address separation of church and state in Texas. But Moses, Moses re, uh, replaced somebody in the textbooks. Martin Luther King. I thought it was Thomas Paine or something. Uh, no, Mo, Moses didn't replace someone. But uh, but when they're writing the standards, they replaced. I mean, who oh, who was it? They they took out. Well, they took out. Uh, Cesar Chavez, I think, and they tried to take out uh, Thurgood Marshall, um, one of the board members. I don't think they got Thurgood Marshall out. Um, one of the board members <coughs> explained there was over-representation of minorities in the curriculum was the words he used. Um, and so they were trying to take out people on that. They tried to take out Thomas Jefferson um, because they didn't like separation of church and state. They tried to take out slavery because they didn't want to remember painful, embarrassing past history. Um, and then when it came down to the textbooks themselves, it was just sort of a weird mix. And so, like, Ronald Reagan got more airtime. George Bush had criticisms of him removed. Hillary Clinton got a section removed because they viewed it as propaganda for 2016. Um, <laughs> like, just like, there's sort of a list. It was like a mixed bag where we won some, we lost some. And there was just random things. People had various, um, we corrected parts about Harvey Milk that were wrong. Um, like, part, like, parts that called all Hindus vegetarians were fixed. Like, and so it was just sort of random, really random things. Some were, we got some things, we got some, they got some things, and then they're just really random things. And that's how it came out, I think. Uh, on the good side, on the good news, there's an article in today's Chronicle about fewer and fewer college students are saying they're associated with a particular religion, so that's going down. Yeah. But I was going to ask you, how do you personally explain evolution when somebody asks you, like I can say that uh, land iguanas went out to the Galapagos. And there was so little food out there, they became sea iguanas you know, going into the ocean for their food. And every plant and animal evolves based on their environment, tropical places and rivers and so on. 
how do you explain uh, evolution? How do I explain evolution to like? Just somebody that asks you. I mean, depends what they ask. I mean, because here's the thing: I'm actually not a biologist, so I can explain. I can explain basic evolution by natural selection. <laughs> how, like, basically the species that reproduces most and most successfully is going to be the most successful and continue on and positive traits are inherited by children and if it's a good trait more of them will survive and reproduce and if it's a bad trait they die out and sort of you can explain that and that's simple and elegant but I honestly can't get into the complex details on the cutting edge and honestly I don't think they have a reason there are many people who are way way better than me at that who write books and papers on that and I can redirect someone to for example, what I use is the uh, Berkeley Evolution 101 if someone really needs to learn evolution and wants to learn. That's a great website that explains a lot of basics of evolution. And I'll pass people on to that. I pass people on to the NCSE. Um, or just, what I say is like, really, like, if you really want, like, if, you, if I get a creationist who, like, because I, I tend also not to try and, if someone's a creationist, it's so hard to change people's minds again because the whole backfire effect, you show them evidence and they come back more convinced they're right. Yeah. And so, they're often not going to listen to you, it's often not worth your time, but there, there's also talk origins. You can re redirect them to the resources, hope they'll change their mind. Or you can say just, hey, talk to your local college professor. I'm sure, like, you know what, most college professors, if they get someone who says, can you explain evolution to me, they'll probably be happy to do it. And so that's always another good resource. Or take a biology course even. Yeah, so, I think you sort of answered my question. My wife's actually a biology teacher, my son's in ninth grade. And they're in Clee Creek School District. And, and what I see is the evolution unit is solid. Yeah. And because of the star test and the teaks, there's almost no free time in a class. I mean, they are cramming material in. And what I see in Clear Creek is every test they take, the next day, they know what every student in Clear Creek made on that test and how every class fared. My wife knows instantly if her students scored well on that test or not. So that was kind of my question is if you've got people, because by the way, in ninth grade, you have to take an end of course test on biology. And so if you had a teacher not teaching evolution, those kids are not going to fare well on that test. No, they won't. Yeah. And, <laughs> but again, like, let's say, let's say you get photosynthesis but not evolution. You might pass your test still. And so it is sort of worth pointing that out because these tests, like, I mean, evolution is the central part of biology right. and everything should be through, run throughout it. But instead, they're really just going to be testing on the evolution chapter. Did you get the evolution chapter? And if you miss the evolution chapter, like, I mean, honestly, like, if I didn't know anything about evolution, but I paid attention for the rest of the class, they'd probably have to make like 90, 92 on the test if I get everything else right besides the evolution section. And, it's, and maybe that's not the way we should be promoting evolution when we're teaching it, but that's sort of the paradigm is that there's a section on it, and so you have to pass or not pass that section. Um, I don't know this is maybe a little picky. Uh, those of who know anything about United Farm Work and Cesar Chavez, he was a specific math scholar. A thing like Cesar Chavez, somebody answering back that he went to maths in California, I don't know if it went every Sunday, but he was a devout Catholic, and, but he got it done. Somebody saying that's ridiculous about Cesar Chavez, just refuting on that point, maybe it can lead to refutation on other points that are, you see what I mean? Uh, refuting successfully Cesar Chavez nonsense about his being atheist, can that lead to refuting other exaggerations? You right. see what I mean? Because that can be proven that he was not. So saying that can be proven, you might go on to other things to convince this person. Do you see what I mean? It's um, a basing point. But even, I think, are you talking about the backfire effect here? In other words, no. If somebody says that the person proved Cesar Chavez was not, he was a mascot, he went to mass. He felt like going to mass, which was his business. But <coughs> saying that your information is wrong, Cesar Chavez, blah, 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 Maybe you can prove the information they're getting on other issues is incorrect. It's a takeoff point. You see what well, I mean? Well, they, they tend not to. I mean, even if they're wrong, they tend not to care that they're wrong. Um, one thing. No. Misinformed, not wrong. 
Well, okay. In other words, using her to take off a point that maybe you're not looking into things sufficiently enough if you accept that, because that can be easily proven. I mean, so we, what I think is the most effective way to change someone's mind is honestly like the family connection. So their kid comes up and says, Mom, they taught me evolution in school and their mom gets mad. They say, well, look, it's right. And, and you can't, like, if you have an emotional connection to your kid, then you're going to be maybe more convinced by them than some random person like me saying evolution's right. And that's always the more effective way to get people to change their minds. It's just hard to do because most of us, I mean, I, like, I've changed, like, I know I've changed my parents' minds on some things and they've changed my mind on other things, but there's been far fewer times I'm aware that I've changed people who aren't closely connected to me or don't listen to me with open ears. And so you need someone, which is, again, why it comes back down to the education, where if you're teaching kids good stuff, then they have a chance to change their parents' minds, maybe, but that's something I'm concerned with, because they'll know it and their kids will also get taught well and it'll continue down from there. So that's sort of how I see this working most effectively. Oh, um, yeah, just, sorry, we, we, we will need to wrap up here pretty quick. We'll, uh, we'll be uh, approaching the end time, the official end time of the event. Uh, so if we could just do one, uh, one, more, one more question. Oh, oh there's only one time. I have this question, just asking you, don't you think that perhaps in your strategy, in the way of dealing with problems, you have actually taken the, uh, the problem wrong? Because the way I keep, uh, while I, uh, I listen to you, if you say that you keep insisting on improving, for example, the textbook, so that the textbook becomes more scientific. And at the same time, you are suggesting that, for example, the American population, something like 50% of them are young earth creations. So at the same time, you are improving the lyrics, but you are not working anything on the song. I mean, when you give this to a young earth creationist and you ask it to go and teach it to the students, what do you think the outcome will be? Well, you hope they'll change their mind, but the thing is, like, so every time I'm on the news, every time I write an article, I'm hoping I'll change people's minds. But I have a much, it's much more indirect when I'm talking to the public. And it's like, I mean, you, you continually do it, you hope people change your mind, their mind, but you have no data on how well you succeeded or what's happening. And so you, just, you do it because you have to do it. But where we can actually see change, hopefully, is like, is there a change in the curriculum? Is there a change in it? And that's sort of the metric we have where we can prove it and fight over it. And you, you, just, you do interviews, you try to do broader public awareness because that's a good thing to do, but it's not really... And it's, it's part of the strategy, because it has to be part of the strategy, but it's not something we really, when we're talking about results, that we can really bring up and show, because it's sort of ephemeral and hard to measure, is what I would say there. But at the same time, I believe that more attention perhaps should be focused on that part of the story, because as you may provide the supply, but as long as the logistic line, as long as the person who's providing it is failing, you should not be expecting a good end result. Well, yeah, which is why every time, like, if I'm on TV, I'm going to say evolution is real, here's why it's real, and do my best to help explain it to people. But people have to listen less when they're watching TV or reading the news than they'd have to do their high school teacher. So I don't know how effective it ever is. All right, well, that's a